My name is Basia Rychalska and I'm a PhD student at uh, Warsaw University of Technology uh, within the MI Squared Data Lab, which you've surely met by now at this conference. Uh, so, I would like to tell you a bit about NMT, as Neural Machine Translation can be called for short. And uh, I'll tell you about what we've achieved till now, uh, what we haven't achieved, although sometimes we do claim that we have achieved, and what can we do about it. So basically, I will approach this from my point of view, which is uh, stemming from my cooperation between uh, Warsaw University of Technology and NTU, meaning Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And uh, yeah, this is the nice group that we're working together with. This is the NLP uh, group at NTU. Um, we are in a kind of friendly relationship, so um, my last slide, and the most important probably, is an invitation for all of you to cooperate with us, because we deal with machine translation, we deal with adversarial examples, model robustness, and many other things. Actually, this group is very nice in, uh, in terms of their performance uh, in uh, getting papers to the top conferences, so if you want to jumpstart your career I just meet some interesting people, it's a good way to go. So, um, what we're doing right now is we are um, contrasting sentence level translation with document level translation. Because uh, it seems that there are some phenomena that appear on the document level that we cannot see uh, at the sentence level. And, um, Let's start with the basic notion of context. So, context is just uh, the whole text that we have read, or it, which uh, surrounds some part that is interesting to us. And context gives us some additional information uh, that we have in our mind while reading. And actually, we need to know some facts to make a correct translation which is a fact that is, uh, up till now, uh, often overlooked. So, uh, from the model's point of view, uh, you've already know what a transformer is from the previous, uh, previous presentation. So, a uh, transformer for machine trans translation stem, uh, is composed of two parts. So, the first part is the encoder. It basically takes an input, which is uh, most often a sentence, meaning separate sentence, one sentence. Uh, it is then forwarded, whatever we compute uh, in the encoder, it's forwarded to the decoder, which combines the knowledge from the encoder and the knowledge that comes from what we've already have translated, because we translate word by word, so we have our translated text up till now. We have the input from the source text. And we combine this all, and we produce a probability of the next word that we want to translate. So what happens when we want to translate on a document level? We add the context, because here you can see it's actually a whole encoder. Because an encoder hill is pretty small. It only takes one input. When, it, uh, when, it, when it's a, a document-aware or context-aware model, it takes a number of sentences preceding the, cur the current sentence, which is here. So you, you see that it grows in complexity. So why make this distinction about context, non-context, and go to the, through the hustle of making, computing all of this. Um, there was a very nice paper um, titled, Has Machine Translation Achieved Human Parity? And it actually showed that for a sentence level, uh, 
the uh, annotators were likely to prefer actually machine translation versus human translation. So they thought the artificially translated text was better. It was better in terms of adequacy, which is uh, kind of the correctness of the uh, translation. It was evaluated by professional translation, translators. And fluency, uh, meaning just the whole idea that we have from reading the translated text, and it just came from regular people, not professionals. So, uh, well, that's nice. For sentence level, we do have uh, a preference for the machine. However, when we move to the blue columns, it's the document level, you can see that human translation is preferred, because the numbers here mean that 37 annotators thought machine translation was better, 11% thought that there is no actual difference between the pairs, and 52% uh, preferred human translators. So the results are reversed here. For fluency, um, there is a big difference as well. And now humans are winning by a large margin for the document level. So what actually is happening uh, with the document levels? Here I'm coming to the uh, to, uh, to, to something that I need to explain to you, because I wanted very much to show you uh, our work together with the NTU that we've basically writing a paper, and I wanted to share, share with you what we achieved in detail. Unfortunately, we are in the anonymity period of a conference that we, uh, we are submitting this work. So I, don't, I cannot give you very concrete details that would allow for our identification and damaging the anonymity in the reviews. So I will tell you about our works, but it's not on the slides. I will just tell you verbally some of it. It's off the record, OK? Uh, so what happens when we go from sentence level to document level? Uh, for starters, this is the problem of anaphora. Uh, anaphora uh, is a problem uh, similar to coreference resolution that you've already seen on the previous presentation. It means that some object is referred to again and again in the text. Like the, here is a German text, Lady Liberty uh, is a female, and then she is referred to by a female personal pronoun, which is Z. And by this pronoun, we know what the next sentences are speaking about. So this is actually a big problem for machine translation, because in the human translation, you can see that the translator obviously knows that he needs to point and translate it as she. However, this is an actually actual result from a machine translation system that uh, is one of the uh, state of the art. Lady Liberty is translated as it. So it makes you unable to understand the text because you just don't, want, don't, don't know what, what, what's being said right now about whom. Uh, another problem is lexical coherence. Whenever you have a phrase or proper name, for example, that should be translated consistently uh, throughout the text, so that, again, you know what's going on, you know that the text is about the same thing all the time. So uh, here in the German text, again, we have Weidet Sound Project, and it's like the same thing for a human. Human knows that it's the same thing, and we should, we should not confuse the reader and translate it differently, or just any 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 time it appears, let's translate it differently so that no one knows what's the, what's what's going on. Uh, machine translation on the other side is doing strange things with this. So not knowing German, you know you have you have no idea that this is the same thing, right? So lexical coherence is about keeping the same uh, translation throughout the text. And coherence is the notion of 
how well the text fits together? Uh, do we have any sentences that seem out of place, that we don't understand, that are weird, not fitting to the rest? And an example, um, the text is generally about history, and in the correct translation we have history, 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 and then someone who is director general of the Austrian State Archives. It's okay, it's again about some archives history, it's passing to the rest. However, here is also a state-of-the-art uh, model that is somehow creating uh, a general of an army. It doesn't fit the text at all. So you need to think whether you really want this model to use it when it can make such a big mistake, right? It's not a small mistake, it's total confabulation. Again, you, to, to measure coherence, you need to <coughs> see the whole bunch of sentences, the whole text. So what's happening right now with this uh, is that uh, we actually don't see these phenomena in some data sets because they are not narratives. So they just, uh, they, they, comp they contain a series of unrelated, mostly unrelated sentences. So you just don't see any problem. Uh, what's, what's even worse is that when, when it does uh, appear, the problem, uh, the authors use the blue score as a measure of the translation quality, which is a very, so probably some of you know the blue score, it's a very uh, ancient sc scoring method for NMT, and it's actually no good for this because uh, it just basically takes n grams, meaning uh, like uh, it looks at, for example, two words at a time, like here. It just uh, sees the text as a bunch of two word chunks and it compares them, the translation with the reference text. So it cannot understand synonyms, uh, it cannot see any relation between sentences as well, because it's just comparing sentence to sentence. Uh, you can see here, I can have two very similar sentences, early puberty, growing older, sooner, and premature puberty, aging earlier. It's the same, right? It's just a, uh, it's just a paraphrase, but the blue score is zero for that. So it's a, it's a bad measure. Uh, and then other, another problem is that we do have some architectures that are claiming to mitigate the problems listed here, but they again claim to be, uh, to be improving based on the blue score. So it's not sure whether they are doing anything at all. For example, just a side note, if you want a uh, better score for translation, you can have a look at, for example, the BERT score which is based on BERT, which means that it's actually um, understanding synonyms and paraphrases. So it, for these two, it would give a pretty high score. And uh, here another score that it, it scored almost as perfect uh, translation. It is freezing today and the weather is cold today, right? It's okay. Uh, yeah, so off the record, what we've done uh, in our work, we've created an automatic benchmark for calculating the performance of the models on these three, um, these three phenomena, plus one more phenomenon that I'm not showing. And uh, we are actually proving that it's possible to do this um, automatically without uh, employing translators and manually analyzing like we've, like, like we've done here, the text. So we're doing it automatically, and we're actually proving that the papers, all of them actually, that have uh, claimed that using blue, they are improving discourse level phenomena like this, they are not. So this is the big takeaway from our, from our paper. It's gonna be pretty interesting. Uh, again, what we would like to do, we would like to see how we can make this better, 
when we already have the benchmark and we can uh, see like, the exact score of the discourse phenomena, uh, we will, and we actually have them already, uh, we will test the two models where we incorporate not only the uh, source context, as you uh, remember here in the, tr in the uh, transformer, there was the source context, we are also joining the target context, meaning we've already translated five sentences. Let's look at our translations of the five sentences and let's uh, attend to them and try to make some meaning out of this. So this is our idea because we think that when, we already, when we've already translated something, obviously we have some errors in our translation, right? Because there's always pretty, maybe not, not always, but nearly always, there is some error, and by looking at the translation containing an error, we are somehow propagating the error uh, further, but still we believe that, uh, for example, for lexical consistency, meaning uh, the consistent translation of phrases, it will help because we will see what we have translated and what, what, what exact vocabulary we have used before, so we can keep to our previously used vocabulary. And also, uh, since we are also very much into interpretability uh, of the models, we want to try different configurations of, uh, uh, of uh, joining uh, the target context into the model. So the first model that we'll try is based on um, actually similar to this one. Sorry, I haven't, I haven't put it here. Just the input from the encoder is going into the decoder. It's merged with the current word. And after it's merged with the current word, we are adding the target, meaning we are squashing the whole thing here, and the target gets a bigger inf influence of the, the, over, the whole, uh, over the whole meaning, because it's other at the, at the end, and it's not squashed along the way. Um, here, on the other side, we are adding uh, the target context sooner, so we are able to see what the result will be when we increase the influence of the encoder, meaning the previous source context. And something else to look out for while, uh, while dealing with machine translation are obviously adversarial examples. I think uh, you've, some of you already know what, what's, what's going on here. So adversarial examples are uh, tricky errors. Maybe they are example which contain, con contains very tricky errors. Uh, like here we have a question answering based on an image. We're asking what color is the tray? The model has got this right, it's pink. However, uh, an adversarial example for that is what color spelled uh, in the British way is the tray. It's a really small change here. It changes the decision to green. Shouldn't happen like that, right? Which color is the tray? Again, we understand this. It's, a, it's an error, okay? But still we should expect that the model understands the question. Still it makes it wrong. And uh, this also is a problem for machine translation um, because it, uh, it damages translations just as any other model in NLP, in, in, other, uh, in any other um, problem in machine learning, images, sound, everything. So uh, what we're doing about that is we've, we've created a library. It's called Wild NLP. And uh, it's, uh, it allows you to produce uh, malformed uh, sentences whenever you input some sentence. Uh, you switch, for example, articles, the, the into a, or you just delete the articles, it, it happens automatically. Uh, you swap the letters, uh, 
uh, you commit QWERT errors, meaning simulation of field typing on the keyboard, and you press something that's around your desired letter. And uh, misspellings, which are common in English, um, writing digits uh, as full words, homophones in English, meaning, uh, meaning words that sound the same are confused in writing, and so on. So basically, when you use this library, you can um, uh, inject errors into your text, and you can see how uh, good or, or bad your model is performing. And what we've actually found for question answering here uh, is that uh, you can see the BERT model was at the level of 50% F-score when we applied the remove char uh, aspect at severity 5, meaning we removed uh, five random characters from the question. So you can see that it fell by 30%, right? It's a lot. And this is a funny example of what happens when you do this for machine translation. For example, you uh, psycho, psycho therapt, in German, you, uh, you inject the number six into this word. Still, you can, as a human, you can read it, it's okay. Uh, but the model, when it sees it, changes therapist into a psychopath. <laughs> so that's why you should worry about adversarial examples. And uh, what more you can do with our library, you can add the, um, the perturbed examples to your training set, and you can uh, train your model on the perturbed data set to make it kind of recognize the errors and adapt to the errors. And uh, we found that uh, it helps. It helps a lot. Uh, like, um, for example, here uh, you have model trained on QVERTY5 modified text, meaning five QVERTY mistakes in the questions, in question answering. Uh, when you've trained that, then you perturb your texts using the QVERTY error. It drops by 5% instead of dropping by infinite, right? So what's the lesson from this talk? There are a lot of problems with NMT, and I wanted to show you that it's, it hasn't, it, it's not finished. It's an active, um, there, is, there is a lot of problems to work on, and very interesting ones. Uh, there are still uh, new problems some, uh, are coming up, so, um, someone approaches it from a different perspective and bam, there is something that no one thought about before. So uh, evaluation and uh, challenging of the established data sets like the WMT data sets, there are not, uh, they are not all that's there because we are constantly, um, constantly finding something more, some new errors. Um, yeah, so that's nice to work, work on that. There is a lot to do. And uh, if you're interested in NMT, robustness generally for NLP, uh, then you're welcome to contact us and work with us, either, with, either within my, my grant, which is about model robustness and adversarial examples, uh, on, or with, with the group at NTU directly, um, then it's about NMT, but also many other topics. So that would be all. Any questions?